What's going on, Rock? Yeah. Everyone doing all right? Everyone doing all right? All right, so my name is Sean Patterson. I'm one of the members of the teaching team here. Also, uh, I'm an Acts 2 community leader. Um, I co-lead uh, an Acts 2 community with that guy right there, Carrie. So, um, man, it's such an honor always to be before you guys today. But we're going to do something a little bit different, as you can see. All right, you guys are looking at me crazy. All right. So uh, we are this week in the last, the very last, the finale of a series that we've been in called Deleting Destiny. All right. And uh, we really came into the beginning of the year. We've been doing this since the very beginning of the year. But we came into the beginning of this year really just feeling like God was, was calling us as, as the people of God to really think about and pray through how we can overcome the deception of the devil. Amen? And so uh, we, we were camped in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, Peter talks about how we need to be sober and we need to be alert because the devil is prowling around, right? He's seeking whom he may devour. Uh, and so as we, we looked at this and as we were praying about this series, we just really felt like God was, was really calling us as a people of God to, to really have eyes to see the strength of the enemy, right? That God is calling his church out uh, to, to, be, to be able to be a people who can see the supernatural when everyone else sees the superficial. And so we've looked at a couple things the last couple of weeks. I think we, we started with um, digital addiction. We went to uh, being disturbed, which was a look at uh, mental illness. Uh, we talked about uh, desire. Then we looked at uh, dysfunctional thinking, and we looked at being disconnected. Uh, we talked about uh, being disillusioned. Uh, we even went into uh, being dirty last week. Uh, Ravon came forward, and she talked about the disease of sin. And so today, we're going to talk about the till death covenant of marriage. You see how I kind of tied that in? Yeah, I worked really, I worked really hard on that. All right, so we're going to talk about the, the till death covenant of marriage. Now, before we get into uh, these awesome couples that are sitting before you, I'll, let me just, can I just set this up? Is that okay? Yeah. So I want to tell you guys a story. So uh, Homer is a, an ancient Greek uh, poet, and he wrote this 24-book poem called The Odyssey. Uh, now, if you're like me in seventh grade, you had to read this, right? You remember that? All right, so he wrote this book, and the 12th book of the series, uh, there's something really fascinating that happens. Uh, first of all, this is a, a book or a poem that follows the life of uh, um, Ulysses as he is traveling home from the Trojan War. And something happens in the 12th book of this where they have to travel by their ship. They have to go past this island called the Island of the Sirens, all right? And this island um, has these half-bird half um, uh, human creatures and they're beautiful creatures and they sing these songs that are so enticing that they lure sailors to drive their ship right to the shores and when they get to the shores they shipwreck and they die at the shores of this island are dead men's bones guys who just could not resist the gravitational pull of their music so Ulysses, he hears about this island, and he really wants to hear the music. And so what he decides to do is he tells this man, I need you to tie me to the mast. Tie me down onto this ship. And that way, when we go past, I can hear the music. And no matter what you do, don't let me go over to the island. All right, and he goes so far and he actually pours wax in the ears of the men. And so as they're rowing, they can't hear the music. And so all they do is they see as they go by, he's squirming and he so badly as they pass, he so badly wants to get to this island. And so he's squirming, he's fighting really, really hard. He wants to get to the island, but they don't go and they make it by. They're able to go home. And so think about Ulysses' approach for a second. All right, he had them tie him to the mast. He had them tie him to the mast. He knew he would go crazy, but if he could just make it through, he knew he would make it home. That was the key, all right? And so I would submit to you that Satan and our sinful self-centeredness uh, really, really makes it extremely hard for us to thrive in marriage. I believe that. And so our wedding vows, this till death covenant that we make to our spouses, these are, these are ways for us to tie ourselves to the mast, aren't they? It's a way for us to tie ourselves to the marriage so that we stick with it during times when our thinking is really, really confused. Now, I believe um, you know, the Bible really, and I am talking a lot, but we're going to get to them. <laughs> I believe the Bible is really clear about this. 
and I've seen it operative in my own life, and I've seen it operative in the lives of other people, and I believe it's also true for the devil, and this is it, that if you set yourself up to defy the will of God, you will only find yourself accomplishing the will of God at your own expense. Did you hear what I said? If you set yourself up to defy the will of God, you will only find yourself accomplishing the will of God at your own expense. And though Satan uh, would love to steal from us, he would love to kill us, he would love to destroy us, although the devil would love to lure us to the island of sirens and get us to shipwreck our faith and shipwreck our lives, although he would be delighted to see dead men's bones at the shores of hell, through marriage, God flips that completely on its head. He does. And so marriage is this, it's this one thing in our lives that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Marriage, it's this thing that um, is uh, really, really painful at times. Can, can anyone say amen? Can anyone? Amen. 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 It's, it's, and it's one of those things that can only achieve what it's meant to do through the methodology of a painful process. And so it is both painful and glorious at the same time. Why is that? Because it's a reflection of the gospel that is both painful and glorious at once. Amen. And so we have up here... Um, just a group of amazing couples um, that I'm excited to have share their story. Everyone up here is very much acquainted with the pain and glory of marriage. All right. Everyone up here understands the hard and the hallelujah when it comes to marriage. And so um, these are all couples that are well known in this house. And so I know you guys know them, um, but I'm, I'm really excited for you guys to hear their story. So I just want to introduce them for anyone who doesn't know them. All right. So, so we have the ever since. All right, and, and uh, go ahead and get him a hand. Hey, man. Yeah. Don't just look at him. All right, this is interactive. All right, so you have ever since. How long have you guys been married? 23, coming out in 23 this year. About 23 years? Okay. Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen. Okay, here we are. Here we are. All right, we have the Hasties. All right. Yeah, give him a hand. You guys are doing better. You're doing better. All right, and, and how long have you guys been married? Uh, we're coming up on two years. Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen. Lastly, we have the Carbajals. All right, give them a hand. I've been, literally, it's been prayer to get me to say their last names right today. All right, and how long have you guys been married? Uh, we've been married 15 years. For 15 years. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're just going to jump into this. So um, I'm actually going to start with the Carbajals. Can you guys just tell us about the heart? Tell us, um, you know, how... Satan and how sin made it really hard to thrive in a relationship. Always ask your wife. Always ask. <laughs> so that's what no, um, a little bit of background first so it all makes sense. Uh, marriage wasn't modeled in my home. My parents weren't married. Uh, grandparents aren't married. Uh, marriage wasn't valued. Um, Christ wasn't valued. So, um, all those issues I brought into our relationship when we met. So that made it really hard for us. Um, a lot of control, a lot of anger. The root of it was fear, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, yeah, he was, he was on us. He was on me a lot, uh, especially when you don't know God or Christ or grace or any of those words. Wow. The biggest thing for us in our family was respect. You need to be respected. Um, so anything I took as disrespect, I would lash out in get it, if, you know, offended, easily offended. And it wouldn't just be with my wife, it'd just be in general, wherever I was, whoever I was with. Um, it was a horrible way to live, but uh, that's how the enemy manipulated his way into our relationship prior to us getting married, um, so. Oh, I wasn't sure if he was gonna share the mic, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, okay. So it's really cute how um, he introduces me because he introduces me as, my wife was raised in the church, and so don't worry, there's a group for us too who are raised in the church. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, although I was raised in the church, uh, my parents were part of the leadership as well, okay. and unfortunately they had an unhealthy relationship that ended in divorce when I was in elementary. That was the start of my abandonment issues and feeling unloved, which led me to accepting an unhealthy and abusive relationship. Mm. So I thought I was done with relationships altogether until I met my husband. 
<laughs> so when I met him, I came with this huge amount of baggage. Um, I was insecure, I had shame, abandonment issues. The list really goes on. And so, um, however, me loving math, I figured this man has a lot of negative and I'm a negative, and like my daughter says, a negative times a negative cancels each other out. It should be positive, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> However, <laughs> that uh, all of my past uh, I never dealt with would make its way into our relationship. So I was oh, so insecure and scared he was going to leave me or cheat on me that I would fight with him. So I was basically trying to sabotage my relationship to confirm that... Uh, to confirm that he would leave me. So I know, dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, the walls that I built up so high was slowly starting to come down. So we made a choice to get married, right? Despite all of our baggage. We even took marriage counseling. And so, uh, <laughs> excuse me. I was excited to go dress shopping. I was explaining this to <laughs> Sean and Amy that uh, I, that my father, I had to kind of um, give him an ultimatum. Either you buy my dress or you're not coming to my wedding. So, <laughs> so he spent all this money and it was like a big thing for my father to do that for me. Um, so he bought this dress for me and um, I was really excited. And a week before our wedding, we were sitting at the din dinner table as a family and we got into one of our heated arguments. So at dinner, um, I told you guys respect's a huge thing for us. So one of what the enemy had been doing prior to this was really attacking me and our finances because um, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I was already taking the trolley to work, working two jobs. We couldn't get through, so it put a lot of pressure on me, and I didn't know how to share the load at that time. Um, and then we had gotten in an argument, and all this stuff started piling up finances, what I thought was perceived as disrespect and just... Uh, I couldn't trust anybody, so even if she went to the store or was with friends, I would have a really hard time with that. You know, I would make accusations. Well, all that stuff just adds up. Mm -hmm. And when we had an argument at the dinner table, um, the enemy just worked his way right into my brain. He said, you know what? I'm leaving. I'm not doing this. And I walked out on her and my kids at the table. It uh, wasn't my proudest moment, but... Uh, that's where the enemy really, really struck hard for us. A week before our wedding, I walked out of the house and um, went over to a friend's and uh, didn't come back at that point. Amen. Thank you. Go with the hasties. Sorry. So, uh, a little bit of our background. We have a, a similar dynamic. Um, I was raised in the church. My dad, a pastor, in uh, pretty much my whole life. Um, so I came from a good um, upbringing, um, but, you know, through friends, you know, at an early age, around 12, 13 <coughs> years old, um, I started getting into drugs and um, substance abuse um, throughout my teen years and into my adulthood. Um, I met Josephine about nine years ago. We worked together. Um, at the time I was married, she was in a long-term uh, relationship. We were strictly friends, but it was um, that's our common denominator. You know, we both uh, struggle with substance abuse, and um, so we, you know, confided in each other and were were um, had a common interest, and so we were just you know friends at that point. Um, and then I'll give it. So I come from quite the opposite. Um, the first time I ever came to Christian church was with Brandon at, here at The Rock um, in 2017. So I was kind of like the enemies, you know, worked on me, um, I guess, since before birth because um, one of my parents wanted to have an abortion. Um, so when that didn't happen, I was born into um, just drug addiction, um, abandonment, abuse, uh, lots of trauma, and that has been like a generational struggle for my family on both sides. Um, so yeah, so I've, I kind of have like a life built on um, knowing the enemy's tactics well. Um, and yeah, when I met Brandon, or uh, we clicked over our common interests, 
interest and um, kind of kept like a distant friendship through the years until in 2017 when I had an experience where I, you know, I was like, God, if you're real, like, I need you to take this from me. Like, I need you to help me. I'm tired of, you know, repeating the cycles. I, I had had a child already by that time. And, um, you know, not to make it okay, but I was, like, doing drugs was kind of like family bonding at my house. And, like, you know, I was taught to, like, sell drugs and um, by my family. And so, um, yeah, so I was just not doing good things. And, and I didn't want to continue that. So... I'd ask God, like, you know, if you're real and you're who you say you are, I need you to take this from me and help me. And I had tried to stop drugs, like, many times, and it didn't work. And for whatever reason, this this last time in 2017, um, I had just what I can describe as, like, a supernatural experience. And um, the obsession was lifted. I was delivered. I, I still, like... Um, <laughs> I still, like, just, like my husband says, it's, you know, even though we've been, like, set free, it's important that we, st it's a gift. Like, I know that it's a gift, and so I steward the gift well by going to NA still and, um, you know, working a program to keep what I have. Um, so, yeah, so that happened, and then um, Brandon and I reconnected in the rooms of NA, um, and, yeah, I was excited to, like, I was like, oh, someone I know, you know, um, so I was done, you know, with addiction, but, um, yeah, my husband. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so she was done, you know, she started, you know, going to church. We started going to church. Um, I was in a sober living house at the time. Um, and so I had gotten, um, I had fallen back into my addiction. Um, I got really good at hiding, uh, my addiction from my family, my friends, um, and so I had this facade, you know, of, you know, look good on the outside. But, you know, I am, um, you know, that progressed into, you know, one of the darkest seasons of my life um, when, before, when we were dating. So we were dating at that point for several months. You know, she, you know, I was trying to hide it. You know, I wasn't the best, but, um, you know, I was trying to hide my using. And, um, but as an addict, it slowly progresses and gets worse and worse. Um, so I, you know, got to the, you know, a place, um, you know, where I had, um, I had overdosed, um, you know, it was, I was using every day, I couldn't stop, I um, was out of control, out of my mind, um, and so um, after my overdose um, was kind of a really big uh, wake-up call, if you will. But I continued using because I didn't know how to stop. Um, so I reached out to Josephine and, um, you know, I said, I just want to get arrested so that I can stop because I don't know how to do it by myself. Um, and so my wife uh, helped facilitate my arrest. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. And so... <laughs> I, I, I asked. In, in her defense, I asked. I, w I wasn't in my right mind, but I asked. Um, and so I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, leave it there. <laughs> All right, well, for us, um, some similarities, but we started getting to know each other at a later time in our life. Um, and so we had been single, both of us, uh, in different ways or, or, or not together for a long time. And uh, despite trying to get to know each other for two years before we got married and thinking that we had, um, you know, worked through a lot of stuff, which I think we did in our, our singleness, we worked through a lot of stuff. Um, and being as honest as we could be, I think, um, and we were pretty um, honest with one another, I think. Despite that, as we get into marriage, uh, shortly into the marriage, my my lust and my pornography use started to, um, you know, come forward more and become um, something that would start to hurt Lene and uh, also cause her, um, not only, uh, it would trigger that um, past hurt that she's going to talk about in a minute, and then also trigger some anger, which then was difficult for me to understand. 
it was difficult for him because I'm very passive. So I would hold it all in and just pull away, and he didn't know how to handle that because he likes to talk. Talk it out now. Get it out. And so when he would start getting back into um, when pornography started getting a stronghold on his life, it stirred up old familiar feelings in my life from my past childhood because I grew up in a confusing environment where my mother was an angry Christian. We went to church and so kind of lived a double standard because my father was not a Christian. And um, my father was an alcoholic who was into porn. And because of this, which was very common in family tradition down the line, generational sins um, of alcohol and pornography, um, I became uh, at an early age a victim of molest and incest and um, lost my place um, from those who were supposed to protect and care for me and even was uh, forced to have an abortion from a result of that. And needless to say, I had trust issues and was fearful to go down this road again and it was starting to feel all too familiar. And so um, early in our marriage, I asked Mike to move out because I think I needed him to see that it was serious and I needed him to have a wake-up call. Yeah, and so as she gets um, more angry at me and more hurt, um, and then um, that starts to build more and more of a wedge in our marriage. And, uh, you know, we started, of course, working on um, our own stuff of what, you know, what was triggering me also is like, I don't know what to do with anger. Uh, you know, we didn't really talk in my family. We, you know, we didn't talk much about emotions. You know, my dad was not an emotional guy. Um, and so when he get angry, okay, we just kind of move away from each other and then we get back. Um, but um, her asking me to move out led me to start to realize that my sin wasn't just affecting me anymore. It wasn't just uh, something I could do and then, oh, I have to deal with it but it was affecting her as well. And that, that realization um, you know, helped me understand that this was preventing me in intimacy with her, but also uh, more realization how it was um, distracting me from who I was to be under you know, God as a man and as a husband to her. Um, you know, I quickly learned that um, I was more selfish than I thought. <laughs> I, I, you know, marriage does that. It helps you understand that you're not this good guy that you thought you were, that you are selfish, and, and, and I was. And, um, and the more I came to understand that I was selfish, the more I understood how much I was hurting her. Um, and then on top of that, through the ups and downs in our marriage, um, you know, then we added, you know, uh, some other people that needed us. You know, we started to add... Uh, in five years in, we started to adopt our sons. You know, we had two, and then we had three, and then we had four boys. And all of them had typical needs plus special needs because they came from abusive homes themselves. And so now, not only am I dealing with stuff as far as how do I work through this stuff and, and be there for Lene, um, you know, now we have these other people. And so the more things that were happening, the more our marriage became put uh, back on the back burner and that, that was uh, making it more and more difficult to love one another. Oh, well. You guys want to add one more to this? Yeah, yeah so uh, Amy and I, uh, I would say the, when things were the hardest for us, it was actually early in our marriage. Um, I had just a few years prior came off of you know, having an encounter with Jesus, meeting Jesus, and everything began to transform for me. My trajectory completely changed um, as far as what God was doing in my life. And then I married the one of my dreams, right? And so we started off and everything was, was great. Um, and I started to see some success in my ministry life. Um, you know, I was getting feedback. People would come to me and they'd say, man, you're anointed. And I know God's called you to preach. And so I was starting to do well. A youth ministry was starting to blow up and everything was going great. But my home life wasn't. Um, Amy had been... Um, diagnosed. And actually, this diagnosis came before we got married, but she got diagnosed with endometriosis, and she had a chronic um, a condition of it. Um, basically, it eats away at the, the, the lining of your uterus. And so she was in pain all the time. And so for me, it was like I was pouring my life into my ministry. I was getting good results there, but I was really struggling at home. And so I'll let her kind of tell her a part of it. 
I don't want to spill tea everywhere. Do I need to this on? I think you're good. You're good? Right. All right, you're good. You're sweet. Um, yeah, so I suffered from severe endometriosis. It kind of snuck up on me as a little girl. It was just um, severe pain during my menstruational cycle. And then it'd be like, as I got older, the week before, then during, then week before, during, and then the week after. Yeah. And then by this time in our marriage, I was in severe pain every single day. There yeah. wasn't a day that went by that I wasn't in pain. I would just have my good days, which is when I was able to function with hard medication. And then there was my bad days when that medication did not work. I was laying in bed, fetal position, uh, shaking, sweating, because I couldn't fight past the pain. Um, And that's what led us up to this specific moment. Let me go ahead. All right. Um, (laughs) So it was, um, I I was having a bad day, and I hate asking anyone for anything, even my husband. I'm that proud, and I'm still working on it. But uh, that specific day, I knew I needed help. So when he got home from work, he's trying to hurry up and get ready for church because huge youth group, lots of stuff to do. And I remember just begging him, I'm so sorry, but can you please stay home? I, I need help. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think I could uh, make it without you. And um, long story short, he ended up going. Um, and that night I'm like, okay, Amy, you got this, you could do this. And I, uh, I'm like, okay, I need to eat something so that when I take my medication, I don't just puke it all out. So, um, I'm not physically able to walk to the kitchen at this point. So I remember getting down on the ground and just kind of like crawling slash army crawl to get to the kitchen but unfortunately, I didn't make it. <laughs> I got about to the, to the middle of the living room, and I just could not make it any further. And at that moment, I was like, Lord, I love you, but right now, I hate ministry. I hate my church, and I hate my husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I uh, spent much of my teenage years Um, living with and at times caring for a disabled mother. And so I had, in that season, bought into a lie that that was my lot for marriage as well. Um, I thought, man, I'm going to have to care for a disabled wife for the rest of my life. And and so coupled that with the fact that going into marriage, the doctors told us, you guys have to have children right away because we don't even know if you guys are going to be able to carry. So you got to have children. And so that also spelled the end of going to college for me. I couldn't graduate college. And so there were a lot of bummers that we were dealing with early on. And so I saw opportunities in front of me, one, to pour into something I was being successful in or to pour myself into my marriage. And I chose to pour myself into ministry, uh, which is what led to that. And, uh, you know, C.S., excuse me, uh, St. Augustine, he, um, in his work, Confessions, he talks about the essence of sin. He calls it disordered love, right? And disordered love is love out of order. Disordered love is loving anything that you should love less more than you should and loving anything you should love more less than you should. Um, And that's what I was doing in that time. And I would say that disordered love, you know, actually shows itself up in many different sizes and shapes. Like as we just listen to these stories, we, you know, see, you know, how it shows up of not really knowing how to love, not being taught. And so you begin to exalt things that you think are more important. You also see, you know, exalting, you know, a drug addiction and how it begins to completely take your life out or even when you get into uh, lust and porn, what it does. But sometimes it can be good things. Like for me, it was ministry. Like it was ministry over marriage and that was breaking my life down. It can be, it can literally be work over family that does that for you. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of us, when we think about marriage, we all want marital bliss, Right. Well, what many of us don't understand is that the bliss often comes after blisters, right? Right. And so we're acquainted with that up here. But I, but I want to take some time as we have it still. Let's talk about what God did. Okay. So what did God do to bring us out of this season? <laughs> we went through it. We didn't want to take you guys on a tangent somewhere and, and, and you guys get out of here at 1.30 here too. So 
um, what, what I didn't tell you guys was God started showing up really early in our life, even when I didn't believe in him. Um, when I met my wife, uh, my dad was fixing her car, so she came to check on her car, and uh, when I went up the door, she was like the most beautiful woman I had ever saw. Like, I couldn't even talk. It was really bad. I think she thought I was deaf. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm serious. I, I couldn't speak. She kept asking for my, my uh, father, and I just pointed to the back room because I couldn't even talk. <laughs> I, I don't know what her thoughts were at that time, but... Uh, it was, it was pretty bad. And then when she left, I told my sister, she's not allowed to come over here. And they were like, why? I said, I'm going to end up married with a job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work. Um, my dad taught me the same thing, how to sell drugs and all that stuff when I was really young, in and out of prison and all that. So I um, didn't believe in working and uh, didn't believe in marriage. Little did I know, God in the background was fulfilling prophecies and speaking through me even when I didn't want him to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, even when I didn't acknowledge him. So it just, you know, it was a really, really, uh, looking back, it's really awesome to see how God plays a part in your life even when you're not asking him to. Um, uh, yeah, and then, um, man, there's just so much. Uh, have, going through this process, actually, uh, uh, we had to dig through a lot of stuff, and it was, it was really amazing to see what God's done for us in our life. He always provided in our finances, even though I was always stressed out about them. Yeah. Um, we never were late on our rent, even when we didn't have it the day before it was due. Wow. Um, and, and my family didn't have money, so it didn't come from them. Can um, you talk about your experience when you were incarcerated? I, I really want them to hear that. So, prior to us... Yeah, getting married, I, uh, I was incarcerated again, um, looking at eight years, had eight year joint suspension, going through the whole court process um, for selling drugs and gang activity and all that other stuff that I grew up in. And uh, she was there for me. And um, when I would get incarcerated growing up um, from 13 to 20, I was only out three and a half years. The rest of the time I was incarcerated. So getting incarcerated wasn't a big thing for me. Um, when I was young, um, I put away a lot of emotions that I thought I didn't need growing up. Mm-hmm. Vulnerability and all those, you know, remorse and all those things that hurt me as a child, past traumas. I put them away really early. So uh, going into incarceration, I ended up in a cell by myself. And I blacked out on the ground and I woke up crying so bad. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I hadn't cried like that in years. So um, it was God that I didn't believe in. (laughs) And he literally replaced my heart with all these emotions that I thought were gone and away from me. And and I didn't ask him to. He did it because he loves me. And um, waking up on the ground, I got off the floor and I was like, if this is you, God, because I was scared. I was literally afraid. I was like the fear of God. They talk about, I had the fear of God. And um, because I didn't think he was real. I believed in the devil, but I did not believe in God. And when God showed up, I was freaked out. And um, nevertheless, I did have friends growing up who would go to church and while they were incarcerated and they'd get out and do the same thing. And I was like, God, I don't want to do that. If you're real, just be here for me. I'll be quiet. I'll do what you want me to do, and I'll get out, and I'll serve you then. And it wasn't that I wasn't serving him while I was in there. I just didn't want to be another statistic or a person that, you know, serves while they're incarcerated, gets out on the street, and isn't real with what they found. I knew this was real, and I wanted to make sure it stayed real. So God knew that, and he honored me, and he found a way for me to get out in, was it four months or six months? or Four months instead of eight years. Wow. wow. Okay. Yep. And uh, when I came home, she said, we're going to church. And she was shocked because I said yes, because I didn't believe in God. Whenever she brought up God in our relationship, we would have an argument because I did not believe in God and I didn't want to hear it in my house. So um, I'll let her touch a little bit on that. Okay. So speaking about that moment, um, just know that your prayers are always heard. So I would pray for his soul um, constantly. And so, yeah, we would definitely have these heated arguments because 
even though I strayed away from God, he never left me. And so I knew because I seen these miraculous healings that God had done so early on that his ways never left me. And so when we, he would say, oh, God's not real, I would get so offended. And we would get in these big arguments. And, you know, so I remember praying to God when he was arrested. I felt like alone. Like this is the first time, like I had abandonment issues, but this is the time where I felt so alone. And I remember crying to God and just pleading, you know, we get to that despair moment where we're bargaining with God. And I remember like praying and crying like, God, I don't want to do this alone. Like, it, please just, you know, send him home. And I, I promise my, your ways will never depart from me. I will serve you to the end of time. And <laughs> here, lo and behold, here he gets out. So I'm like, all right, we're going to church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, God has showed up in so many ways, and I really want to try to give time for everyone else. So I had to write this down. I'm trying to um, summarize everything because, you know, I could be here every Sunday and tell you how good God is, right? Amen, and just amen. how wonderful, just the works that he's done. Can you come So, um I really like data and stats, not because I follow what the world says, but because it's in those moments when people are an exception to the world. That is where I, um, I see God show up in big ways. <clears throat> so I was explaining, I was like really looking and digging into what are the reasons for divorce, right? And so the seven risk factors for divorce are young age, less education, less income, premarital childbearing, premarital cohabitation, no religious affiliation, and parent divorce. So we had a seven out of seven. I like getting A's, but not in this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was like, wow, you know, everything that the world said that we should have not been where we are today, right? And wow. so it's, it's wow. God, right? Wow. But God. So everything, you know, um, I think of like me and my kids, we share each other, like we share these memes and like, ah, look at this, right? And there's this meme where this kid was doing a math test and didn't know the answer, but he put, Jesus is always the answer. <laughs> so, uh, so, right, uh, so while I, Timmy did not get an A on that test, however, Jesus has always been the answer to all of my problems, right? And so, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so... Let me, I'm sorry. So I have learned to trust him in everything, right? So I just want to say if you're struggling with worry or fear, God wants uh, you to learn to trust him in this area of your life as well. So don't be scared to, I learned to ask my, uh, my spouse to pray with me, not for me. Like we got to sit and just, you know, to be vulnerable with our spouse. And I learned to, um, that has been like a tremendous growth with us in that aspect um, let's see. Yeah. So Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So God has restored our past and given us a future. We have learned to communicate with each other and not at each other. Yeah. Uh, we've learned to encourage each other instead of tear each other down. We learn to dream big together. So my insecurities of not being smart enough, God's made a way for me to uh, attain a double master's degree. Come so on. Uh, Come on. also knowing what I do or how much education I have, that does not define who I am as well. I no longer try to get my identity from the world, but trust in who God says I am. I no longer have a poverty mindset. So I trust in the Lord with all of our finances and live in faith as he has just given us so many multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I no longer compare myself to others and I can trust my husband even when he's across the United States for weeks at a time. <clears throat> I open myself up to not only trust in him but to be able to trust a community that would pour into our relationship and help us thrive because that is a big key to marriage as well, to surround yourself with a supporting and loving community. So, that's sorry, good. that's it. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. So that's where we are, and I'm truly thankful for that. Um, but I didn't tell you guys how we got through me leaving. 
So I'm just going to back up a little bit there and tell you. So um, I went to a friend's house. I'm just going to put this down. Should be spill proof. Um, uh, I went to a friend's house and uh, when I left the house and we had that heated argument and I decided I am marrying this woman. I didn't want to be married anyway. Right. And, uh, and mind you, I had done the marriage counseling and all that stuff. And I thought I knew God, but you don't really know God in the American sense, you know, believe is an, can be a noun, but in the Hebrew, it's a verb. You actually have to do it. It's an action yeah, word. Yeah. Like it, believing is action. And, um, so when I went to my friend's house, I was telling him what happened. I'm like, Hey, I need to stay here. And he's telling me, you need to go home. <laughs> you know, I thought he was gonna be happy to see me and he was happy to see me until he found out I was gonna stay there. He was like, nah, she's the best thing that's ever happened to you. What's wrong with you, man? You haven't been in any trouble. You've been doing good. You're going to church. And, uh, and at that moment, I was like, man, had me started thinking, you know, the, the gear started turning like, what am I doing? So I went and sat in my car. And back then, that's when the flip phones were around. I flipped open my phone and I could see a picture of me and her like sleeping, like just, you know, um, and uh, God started ministering to me in that moment. And he, he asked me, like, what are you doing? You were made for each other. I put you two here to find each other. You know, in spite of all the odds, in spite of what the world says, he just started really working on me. And I started tearing up and crying in the car. And I um, mustered up enough energy and grace, which I did not have at the time. I knew it was a word, but I didn't know how to use it. Um, and humility um, to, to dial that phone number and call her and ask her to come home and ask for forgiveness. And I think that's probably the first time I've ever really asked her for actual forgiveness and meant it. Wow. Um, and it wasn't me that did it. It was me just listening to God so that I can muster up the strength to do it because I felt like I was, everything I thought I felt was wrong. I wasn't led by my emotions at the time. It was, those tears weren't just manifesting from these emotions that come from the world. They were coming from God because he was just working on me in such a real way. And um, um, she actually let me come home. It was a quiet, long conversation, but she let me come home and we got married and God's been with us ever since. Has never left us. Amen. And um, yeah, and, and, and where he's brought us today, if he would have showed me this before we got married, we would not have been here because I would have ran away really quick. Because the dreams are bigger than I could even fathom. Amen. You know, Amen. God has always provided for us where we couldn't afford our rent. We now own our own home. She's got her degree. I've got my degrees. We've done everything the world said we shouldn't be able to do. Amen. Amen. And that's because God said we're going to do it. Amen. And um, people would ask me, like, well, because they can see, obviously, we have a really good marriage, and, and, and I'm not boasting about that, but I'm very thankful and grateful for that. So when people ask, well, what is it? What do you guys do? I said, for me, it's always praying for my wife and uh, asking God what she needs for the season. Well, how do you do that? Well, you seek God first, right? Matthew 6. You know, seek the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and everything else will be imparted to you. Well, that doesn't mean for yourself. That means for every relationship you have with your friends, with your work, with your colleagues, with your wife, all that. And then you got to remember that love is a choice for me, at least. So for me, it's my life verse is always Galatians 513. For you have been called to liberty. Come on now. However, don't not use that liberty for the opportunity of the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Well, I will serve my wife and pursue my wife and date my wife until go. I can't do it anymore, until I'm gone and God gone back with God. So Amen. that's what makes our marriage successful and works for us. So I hope and pray that whoever it is that's out there and is even thinking about marriage, that they don't look at each other for the answers, but they look to God because we're going to fail each other and that's okay. We're human, Amen. but God will never fail us. Amen. So in that divine triangle, you can always find happiness and bless. And those are the things that you just can't pay for. So got to preach. Amen. 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 Hasties. All right, so I'm in jail, um, <laughs> and God loves guys in jail. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to back up just a little bit, um, you know, before this, when I was in my darkest season, you know, God had, you know, she's new to church. God has been giving her prophetic dreams and visions 
God's got my number. He always has. I can't get away from God. I can hide. I can save face, you know, but God knows what's up. Um, so, you know, he, God is downloading what I'm doing um, to her, you know, calling me out. Go check on him right now, right in the middle of me, you know, doing, you know, what I was doing. Um, and so, you know, God's got my number. So I get to the place, I'm in jail, and, um, you know, I had the opportunity to, um, to go into a program after that. And so um, I just did a short stint in jail and was able to go to um, Salvation Army. Um, I was court ordered to go for 30 days. Um, but, you know, one thing that she told me was God has, or you have to go through God to get to me. Any man who's gonna, who I'm going to marry has to go through God to get to me. Yeah, that was after the second time that he went to jail while we were together. The first time was, the first time I, like, went against every vow, you know, I, I was trying to get away from that. So, like, growing up, the men in my family would go to jail. My dad's been in prison my whole life, in and out, um, and I would never go visit him. I was like, I will absolutely never go to a jail and visit anybody. And then came Brandon Hasty, and I, yeah, I, you know, God um, really was with me through the whole process, or I would not have survived it. Like, um, yeah, I, so I laid a boundary the first time, which I crossed. I said, I will only go through this one time with you. Like, that's it, and I'll support you as a friend. Like, we're not together. And the whole time he's like, no, we're getting married. And I'm like, you're in jail, so no, we're not. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, he, he tried, but, you know, he had another little stint. And that was when I, that was like five days or something. And I told him, I'm absolutely done. Like, you have to go uh, through God to get to me. And, um, you know, any, who I marry, like, has to be submitted to a higher authority. Like, that's just, like, to help you because you need that to deal with me. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, All right. so, I had a lot of hard work ahead of me. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, so once I got into the Salvation Army program, um, you know, that's where I really put in the work, and that's what I had to do. Um, she had, you know, a miraculous deliverance from drugs and alcohol. My dad has a similar story uh, where they were delivered and never touched it again. Um, I, it took a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of prayer um, to get to the place where I, I truly believe I am de delivered today, um, but I do have to steward that daily still. Um, I still have to work and steward the gift that God has given me. Um, so I, so I um, was court-ordered 30 days, Salvation Army. Um, I chose to stick it out. Um, you know, that was kind of, uh, you know, I could get out after 30 days and go back to my normal life. But, um, you know, I wanted to give myself the best shot I could. Um, so I stuck it out six months in this program, um, faith-based program, where um, I really got recentered. Every um, they call it Salvation Army because it's similar to the Army. You got to wake up at 6 a.m., fold your bread, uh, fold your bed, and they check your bed, your quarter bounce. Uh, you got two shirts, two ties, two socks, two shoes. You know, it was a, a strict routine, but that's what I needed at that time. So um, I completed that program. Um, meanwhile, we, you know, we were dating again, um, and so. Um, the day before I graduated is when I proposed to her. So um, I played her a song at a coffee shop <laughs> and uh, proposed. And, uh, and so, um, you know, truly the, the redemption of our story is, is our wedding day. Um, I mean, we got married on this stage here, and um, that is when, you know, we made our covenant before God, and that was the turning point, like we made it, um, you know, we put in a lot of hard work, pre-marriage counseling, um, and, um, John and Patty, they were awesome. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've had to work really hard to get to where we're at today. Um, and so, but you know, we had a, a fairy tale wedding. I mean, it was like, we made it, you know, this was mm -hmm. our redemption. Um, and, and God continues to bless us in our marriage, and we still put in the work. Uh, we still go to 
conventions and online Zoom seminars, and you know we we got to continue to work at it. Um, and so, but but life is really good today. It looks a lot different than our darkest season. So. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, when we decided to get married, we had discussed early on that we would never use the D word, divorce. It was not ever going to be an option. We figured that um, if it wasn't an option, then it wasn't a route that our minds would be, have a chance to go down as an excuse. So that helped us through the years when we would go through difficult times. It reminded us that there was no quitting or giving up or just walking away and calling it quits. Um, this was a commitment, a covenant, a bond that was worth a fighting for. Also, a reminder, we were actually fighting against the enemy and not each other. Yeah, and so the more, you know, when we would get into uh, difficulties or even uh, times when I was asked to leave, those alone times is when God would continue to remind me, of who I was and refocus me on what I needed to do and how I needed to get right with him because if I wasn't right with him then I couldn't be there for her and I just remember there are many times God would do something like this but I remember one night um, listening and, and, and using worship music and, and just asking God you know I'm alone and I don't know how to work through this and he and I just said if you're really here, I need to know you're here. And his father heart literally embraced me. I mean, I just felt this warm hug. And I just started bawling through that whole time and just realizing um, more and more how much he is my father and that I'm his son and she's his daughter. And that I want to uh, honor her as much as um, he loves us, right? And so... You know, that meant I needed to get back into his word, whether it was listening to it, reading it, um, or, or watching it. Somehow, if, you know, I would get bored with reading. So I had to change it up and figure out different ways to get the word in. I also had to get connected with other people because I couldn't do it by myself. I didn't know how to be a husband very well. I mean, I didn't, this was my first really relationship, let alone marriage. And I needed to know what others were doing. So sitting with other men or sitting with other couples was in, invaluable to us um, to help us get into a different space. Um, and then, you know, the more I would lean into him and get right with him, the more he kept on helping me understand that I wasn't there to um, change her anger or change her hurt when she would come at me with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Instead, I was there to be present and just be available to her and uh, validate her anger, validate her hurt. Because even though I had hurt her, it wasn't only me. It was all these other people before me who had hurt her even more. And I was to be the representative to sit there and, and, and allow her anger to be, and allow her hurt to be. And that was hard, but at the same time, I started to learn this isn't my anger, this is hers. Just be here for her. And I think that started to help our relationship for sure. <laughs> um, and because of that, one of the times when things were starting to get heated, where we would start to argue and I would usually shut down or go to my room and choose to numb out with alcohol, Mike was choosing to respond differently. It would pretty much slapped me upside the head. Um, God stopped me in my tracks and showed me something had changed in Mike. It was frustrating at first, but just like in Romans 12, 20 through 21, where it says to heap coals on our enemy's head and to not overcome and conquer by evil, but overcome evil with good, Mike's actions to respond more like Christ started to change my heart, and I was beginning to feel loved, cherished, and protected by him. Oh, it's making me cry. <laughs> You know, and the more we would do that, the more we would come to know one another, understand one another. And I think the biggest thing for me has been that um, I want to get to know her. And that's, she's different than we were 23 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm different than I was 20 years ago, right? And so um, constantly trying to get to know one another, 
Um, and we just know that also when we would do that and actually connect together, whether it be in uh, parenting, whether it be in ministry, God was powerful. God would move in us, and he put us together for a reason, because we both have a mother heart and a father heart that we knew when we were together, no matter who we're with, that's what, what God's going to use, and God can, can just change us, let alone the world. Amen. 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 So well, our service is running a little long, so here's what we're going to do. Um, Amy and I, we're actually going to finish our story, but if you have little ones, if they are in child care, we have people who are looking for you. <laughs> so if you don't mind, please, let's go get our kids. Again, this will be online. You can come back. That'll be fine. But I just want to honor those who are uh, taking care of our children right now. That's okay. All right. So for, for Amy and myself... Um, yeah, we certainly, um, you know, just thinking about that, that moment, we just were not in a good place at all. And I did feel that God was beginning to do something transformative in my own heart during that season, but I just had no idea how to fix things with us. Like, they, they felt almost beyond repair and really, really hard. And, um, and then there was one night that Amy's going to tell you guys about. Yeah, um, I would say that there was a turning moment, and uh, that turning moment started with me. I was trying desperately to pack to leave for a woman's retreat that next morning, but I was in pain, <laughs> and I was, um, I was so desperate just to feel a little release of pain that I humbled myself, and I say humbled myself because Sean and I were not doing good in our marriage, and he was the very last person on the yeah. face of this earth I wanted to pray with. Mm-hmm. But I humbled myself, and I asked him to come to the couch and pray with me for healing, which was also awkward, because... Yeah, there was a couple things going on. First thing was, it was very apparent, like the tension in our home was really thick, so... Yeah. She asks me to pray. And I'm already sitting around watching her pack. I'm like, why are you going anywhere? <laughs> like, you can barely even move around here. And so then she asked me to pray. And I just really didn't have a whole lot to offer. Like, I just didn't feel like I had it. Um, and we hadn't really even really seen God heal. So for us to, to pray that God would heal, we were just like, all right, well, let's do it. I mean, we have no choice. And so that's what happened. Well, he prays, and then I get even mo- more irritated with him because yeah, yeah. I thought he prayed the lamest, yeah, most yeah. unpassionate <laughs> prayer ever. And I was like, why'd I do that? Whatever. So I just got up off the couch, and I walked into the bedroom to just force myself to pack because I was going on this women's retreat. <laughs> and um, I was packing, and then just doing my thing, and then I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm not in pain. Mm. And there had been moments laying in bed where I would just cry out to the Lord, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, you know, heal me. And I would get like a release in pain. So it would drop from like a 10 to like a 6 or, you know. Um, But this time, it was the first time I had not felt pain in years. Yeah. And I like kind of chuckled myself and yelled to Sean in the other room, hey. I was like, uh, I don't know how long it's going to last, but uh, I have no pain right now. <laughs> yeah. And I don't remember my reaction. I, I think I blew it off. Like, I was like, okay, no big deal. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so, so that happened. I mean, God heals her in that moment. And uh, she goes on the retreat. She comes back and she's still whole. She's doing very well. And I really, that was when the trajectory even of our, our marriage began to change. Uh, we we really start to see hope arise in Amy. Yeah, um, it wasn't just a physical healing. It was um, a resurrection. That hope was able to resurrect in my life because the pain had taken my marriage. It had taken the call on God's life for me. I was like, Lord, I know you've given me visions and dreams, but they will not take place as long as I'm in this pain. And um, with the healing uh, came that resurrection of hope. And I was like, okay, Lord, like I, at this point, I choose, I will walk blameless. I will serve you 110%. Yeah. 
I will, um, in, that, in that time, I guess that hope helped me to become the redeemer in our relationship. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what I saw, um, that, you know, God can't heal a marriage without a redeemer present. And it was in that moment that I began to see Amy really look like Christ in our marriage. Um, you know, the Bible talks about how, you know, Jesus Christ, as he was suffering, um, he, did, he was reviled, but didn't revile in return. As he was suffering, he didn't utter false threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. I watched my wife do that. I watched her treat me a lot better than I deserved uh, in that season, and it completely broke me. It broke me completely. Um, and that became the basis of, of the change in our lives. And so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to shut this down, but I just want to share a few other things with you guys as we shut that um, you know, marriage has the power to set the course of your life as a whole. And if your marriage is weak, it doesn't matter what the world looks like to you as you walk out of your door. Your neighbors can love you, your coworkers can pat you on the back, but you will still walk about in weakness. But you can flip that on his head as well, because if your marriage is strong, it doesn't matter what the world says about you. You can walk out and your, your neighbors are throwing eggs at you, right? You struggle at work, but you will walk about in strength. You'll walk about in strength. You know, there's a, an ancient story of uh, these bricklayers who showed up to go to work. And as they show up to go to work, uh, someone asked them, what are you guys doing? And one of the bricklayers said, I'm laying bricks. The second bricklayer said, I'm building a wall. But the third one said, I am constructing a cathedral for the glory of God. Now think about this, three bricklayers all doing the same thing for different reasons. And what you guys see up here are bricklayers who are constructing cathedrals for the glory of God, right? And why is that? Let me tell you why this is. Because people who plant trees are not interested in shade for themselves. But they know that generations from now, their children's children, will be able to rest under that for shade. Amen. That's what it's about. And that's what marriage is meant to do for us, guys. And so Jesus was tied to the mast for us, wasn't he? Uh, he faced the music for us, but he didn't escape. He didn't get away. And rather than going to the island of the sirens, he went to a Calvary. He went to a hill called Calvary for his bride. Jesus was shipwrecked and destroyed so that we would not only survive but so that we would have the sweeter song of his triumph and as an anthem so that we can enjoy this life in the full and that in the next, amen? So we're gonna pray in a minute. But as we think about what it looks like to be uh, you know, uh, those who build cathedrals for the glory of God, if you're asking yourself, how can I build a marriage like that? Let me tell you, this is what it's about, is you have to love your spouse like Christ loved the church, amen? This is what we do. Right? Love, love, your, love your spouse as God and Christ loved you is the key. It's the key. And so as we close, I just want to give us this thought. All right. And I'm going to have our friends, just if you guys can just stand down below um, to be available to pray. I, I really want you guys to know this, that you know, when you, those of you who are married in here today and those of you who hope to get married, when you walk down the aisle, You walk down the aisle, you are going to make promises like this or you made promises like this. And go ahead and put that, that graphic up. When you walk down the aisle, this is what you say it, said to your spouse. You said, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor. You said something like this, right? In sickness and in health, in good times and in bad, in joy as well as in sorrow, until death do us part. That's something like what you said that day, amen? But in our marriage to Christ, Jesus took on our worst so that we could have better. Jesus became poor so that we would become rich. Jesus bore our sin sickness and he offered us health in exchange. Jesus took on our bad to make us good. Jesus exchanges our sorrow for joy. And it was all because of his death on the cross that accomplished this. And so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, this service has run long, and God bless you for still being engaged with us. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. This is not a time to follow your heart, but this is a time to lead it.
do not let what's wrong with your marriage, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with your spouse, keep you from worshiping what's right with God. And so if you have to do business today, if you have to look your spouse in the eye and apologize, this is the time. Because if you do small things like they're big things, God can do big things like they're small things. And it just may look like coming forward and getting some prayer today because God is here and he can heal you. Amen. So all eyes closed, heads bowed. Is there anyone here who would say, Sean, just hearing these testimonies, these stories, I know God is working in me. And Sean, today, I need to make a decision for Jesus. I need to give my life completely to Jesus right here, right now. Would you slip your hand up? No one's looking. Slip your hand up. I see you, sister. I see you. Anyone else? I see you. I see you guys. Amen. Amen. If you're here, you say, Sean, I'm a believer, but I've not been running this race well. I have not been building a cathedral to the glory of God. I've just been surviving. But Sean, today I want to make a decision. I want to do this right. Raise your hand. I'm here for you too. There you go. I see you too. I see you, sister. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you that they came here today with a heart expecting to meet you and meet you, uh, meet them here, you did. So Lord, there are people here who are hurting. There are people who through marriage have really, I felt like they've had a raw deal. They've really struggled through it. But I thank you that you use uh, the the, the pain that happens in marriage, Lord, for a, a resurrection, a glory that looks so much like what your son did for us on the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you for all you're doing in our lives. We thank you, God, that you're doing work in so many of us today, Lord God. In Jesus' name, everyone said it.